Broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's learning session on the Accountability Framework Initiative organized by WWF Forest and Climate. Thanks for taking the time to join us today. My name is Emmeline Gasparini, and I am a communications specialist with the Forest and Climate team. And our presenters today are Adrian Stork of the Rainforest Alliance and the Accountability Initiative Framework Initiative and Akiva Fishman of World Wildlife Fund. Next slide, please. Before we begin, I'd like to go over a few logistics and some frequently asked questions. For those of you who have participated in past sessions, this will sound familiar. Yes, today's presentation is being recorded and you can find the recording within a few days on our YouTube channel. And to get to the recording, you can go to youtube.com and search for WWF Forest and Climate. There are two audio options. You can listen through your computer or dial in through the phone number that was provided in your registration email. And it's important to note that if you experience audio difficulties while listening through your computer, those are sometimes caused by having too many browser windows or programs open at once. So feel free to close some of them, which usually solves the issue, or you're always welcome to join by phone. And if you continue to have technical difficulties, please send me a message via the chat or questions function and I'll try to get you sorted out as quickly as possible. Along those lines, questions are absolutely welcome. You can send your questions anytime during the webinar using the toolbar on your screen and we'll answer as many as possible during our allotted time. After the webinar, you'll receive a link in your follow-up email with additional forest and climate resources from WWF and the Rainforest Alliance and Accountability Framework Initiative, including a link to the YouTube channel where you can watch a recording of the session once it's posted. So thank you again for joining us. And with that, we'll get started. Next slide, please. Akiva, I believe you're up first. Yes, thanks, Emmelyn. And thanks to everyone who's joined the call to be with us. So I'm Akiva Fishman with WWF's Forest team. And I'm very pleased to share this presentation with Adrian Stork, who is Senior Program Manager for the Accountability Framework Initiative. It's obvious from Adrian's title why she's presenting, and I'll be speaking as WWF representative on the Accountability Framework Initiative steering group. WWF has been a major contributor to this initiative, and we are particularly pleased to have helped ensure that the guidance developed by the initiative is relevant both for supply chain focused strategies for addressing deforestation, conversion, and human rights violations, as well as for broader landscape and jurisdictional strategies, which we'll talk about a bit later on. Next slide, please. So what we'll do first is give an introduction to explain what this is all about. I'll start us off briefly and then hand it over to Adrian. Adrian will then talk about how users of the accountability framework would actually use it. And then I'll dive a little deeper for this audience on the section of the framework guidance that deals with achieving commitments to address deforestation, conversion, and human rights violations through collaboration with other stakeholders. Next slide, please. So let's begin with an introduction to the Accountability Framework Initiative. And if you go to the next slide, I'll start with a preliminary note on terminology. When we talk about the Accountability Framework Initiative, or AFI, this is the coalition of NGOs, which we'll say a bit more about later, that came together to develop guidance to accelerate progress and improve accountability for ethical supply chain commitments in the agriculture and forestry sectors. The Accountability Framework is this guidance or in other words, it is the output of the AFI. It provides a set of common definitions, norms, and guidance designed to add clarity and consistency to the way in which commitments are set and implemented. We'll talk through some of this guidance, but I want to flag for this audience in particular that part of the guidance focuses on what companies can and should do to work beyond the boundaries of their own supply chains together with governments, civil society, and other stakeholders. In addition, while this guidance is designed to help companies meet their commitments, it can also help these other stakeholders understand the actions that companies are increasingly going to be taking to address deforestation, conversion, and human rights violations associated with commodity production. This will be incredibly important as Red Plus programs and other landscape and jurisdictional initiatives are developed and rolled out so that companies, governments, and others can ensure they are acting in concert to address common challenges. Now, let me turn it over to Adrian to talk about how and why AFI came about. And you can turn to the next slide. Great, thank you so much, Akiva, and welcome everyone. Thanks for joining us today. The Accountability Framework Initiative uh, was developed and kicked off 
around two and a half years ago um, with the aim of addressing the number of commitments that we were seeing around deforestation and ethical supply chains um, and to address the lack of implementation of the commitments in this space. So we noticed through a period of 2012 to 2018 a huge rise in the number of commitments uh, in various sectors including palm oil, timber and pulp, soy, cattle, as well as cocoa and others. However, we were not seeing the same type of uh, reporting and uh, progress against these commitments as so there was a lag in between those and we recognized that there was a need to address the way these implement these commitments are being implemented excuse me and also the lack of clarity around what implementation should look like next slide please so we knew that to address the issue of tropical primary forest loss which we see is still increasing that we needed to be able to have clear a clear idea of the scope of commitments and how they should be implemented currently deforestation human rights violations continue to persist in these key sectors there are material risks for companies as well as their financiers and investors and a lack of clear accountability and a lack of clarity around how commitments should be set and implemented can also lead to greenwashing in some cases. So these challenges remain unresolved. Next slide, please. And uh, in addition to this, there's challenges around uh, the way that different uh, commitments were being implemented and rated and understood. So it was very difficult to measure progress without common metrics for accountability. And this could then um, uh, hinder the successful implementation of commitments as well as clear uh, guidance and communication around um, how they were being um, reached, if at all. So, for example, we were seeing in different uh, palm oil scorecard ratings or different um, types of rating tools and assessment mechanisms, um, different different types of metrics being used, and so different signals oftentimes being sent to companies. For example, with a single company, they could have a score of an A with a certain scorecard um, and then a much lower score with another based on the same um, the same results that they're reporting in their annual reports due to a differentiation in the metrics being used to measure their progress. And so the accountability framework also recognized that there's a need to work with the reporting and assessment community and to start to align common metrics we were developing with the way that companies, these metrics were then being used to assess companies and their progress. Next slide, please. We started out this initiative looking at the topical scope of around deforestation, conversion and protection of other natural ecosystems, respect for human rights, including labor rights, and looking at producer and community livelihoods. This scope largely mirrors the scope of many company commitments in this sector, and so we wanted to make sure that the initiative were to be successful, that we were addressing and mirroring the same scope of company commitments um, to make sure that we were covering all of those same, um, same topic areas. We looked across a variety of supply chains and a variety of geographies. So we looked um, primarily at the main drivers of deforestation, including palm oil, soy cattle, the others that you see here in this center column, as well as rubber, um, coffee, and others. And we looked across all of the different tropical geographies, including South America, Southeast Asia, and West and Central Africa. However, I do want to make a note that the accountability framework itself is applicable to other producing regions. So it is not limited to trop the tropics per se, but we did start there when we were um, scoping and looking at um, implementation of commitments, et cetera, and metrics, um, as this is where we see the largest drivers of deforestation and largest loss of forests currently. Next slide, please. We're aiming to provide a common approach reflecting consensus and collaboration. So from the very beginning, this initiative was a collaborative effort aiming to reach consensus and to send a clear signal to companies uh, and to our other peers working in the reporting and assessment space around what we should expect and what we should be looking for uh, for these types of commitments and, of course, their implementation and the results. So the initiative itself uh, is, a, is a consensus, it's a collaboration rather, um, between the different organizations that you see here on this slide. So we have 14 steering group members, we have two independent experts as well who have joined our coalition, but we had many, many other organizations that were a part of developing the framework with expertise around natural ecosystems, human rights, and other topics. In order to reach this collaboration, or this consensus, excuse me, as well, 
we worked with a variety of other initiatives and worked with all of those um, already operating in this space. Um, so it was very important for the accountability framework to build on the existing work and to complement and provide this sort of overarching um, meta framework and common metrics, um, norms, et cetera, that could really start to link and even help the effectiveness of other initiatives um, working around ethical supply chains. So as we developed the framework, we worked very closely with the high carbon stock approach and high conservation value. Um, resource network, the collaboration for forests and agriculture, addressing the soy and beef supply chains in Brazil, Paraguay, and Argentina. We worked with a variety of national, regional, and jurisdictional approaches, which we'll talk about a little more later, but those included the Africa Palm Oil Initiative, Cocoa and Forests, et cetera. As I mentioned already, we worked closely with a lot of the reporting and assessment initiatives such as CDP Forest and others such as Forest 500 and other global canopy um, projects, as well as SPOT uh, and then monitoring systems such as Global Forest Watch. And we've also been working closely around development of key performance indicators for the investment community with Ceres, with the UN Principles for Responsible Investment, um, and then of course working with many other certification systems um, to support alignment with the framework. Certification being one of the means by which a company obviously um, meets their commitments in certain supply chains. And all along for the past two years as we were developing the framework, we worked closely with stakeholders in different producing regions as well. So we had a series of consultations. Um, during those consultations, we had workshops specifically in the regions to gather the inputs and perspectives of those working at the production and processing level, as well as those working in and with government on various initiatives related to ethical supply chains and their production. And of course, um, we worked closely as well with the private sector to gather their perspective and inputs at all times with the aim of making sure that the guidance in the framework was targeted towards the needs of these companies and would in fact meet our overall goal of helping to accelerate progress towards the implementation of their commitments. Next slide, please. This is an important slide, um, mostly because we want to be very clear about what the accountability framework is and especially how they framework is meant to be used. So first and foremost, this has been created as a global public good. Um, as mentioned on the previous slide, the initiative itself um, is formed by a coalition of civil society groups, and the guidance in the framework is based on the consensus reached between these groups or the input of the many others that we've been working with. It's intended to be used by companies and others with the aim of protecting forests and ecosystems and for the benefit of people. It is a set of clear norms and guidance. It contains metrics, definitions, guidance around monitoring and verification, guidance around reporting, et cetera. And this is aiming, of course, towards to address company commitments across different contexts. So the framework is very much something that is meant to be a set of clear norms that can be used in multiple commodities and geographies. And it's working to align the different monitoring, reporting, and assessment initiatives and tools. And with this, we hope that, of course, um, it will then provide greater clarity overall for this sector um, and hopefully greater um, accountability um, and transparency as well. What the framework is not, however, is a commercial product or service. Um, so it is not something that um, is revenue generating or that we are aiming to um, to develop out to be. It is not a certification system, so this is not something that could be a company could audit against in terms of its um, the way it applies the framework. Rather, it is guidance um, for companies to be able to um, implement better implement their commitments and and for the implementation to be aligned with global norms and standards, um, consensus-based norms and standards. It also is not to be used for, for its own assessment or rating or benchmarking purposes. We're working very closely with the existing reporting and assessment initiatives um, in order to strengthen those and to better align across that community with the different definitions and norms and metrics in the framework. Um, and we see very much those initiatives as being the primary tools for assessment. The accountability framework, in turn, is not meant to be used in that way. Next slide, please. So I'll talk a little bit about stakeholder application um, of the framework now. Next slide, please. 
we see the framework, um, this guidance within the framework, um, as something that can be used for companies along their journey um, towards ethical supply chains. So there are components of the framework that companies can use as they are setting their commitments, then as they are taking action, as they're implementing the policies that they've developed in their commitment, and also when they're demonstrating progress. I think you can forward the slide and we have some more. Yes, exactly, thank you so much. So the framework is composed of um, multiple, um, has multiple components. First and foremost, around setting commitments, we have our first three core principles of the framework um, that address this. So these core principles set out the scope of what a good commitment looks like. It includes protection of forests and ecosystems, respect for human rights with a particular sub-principle on labor rights, as well as the specification of commitment. So what should commitments contain? How should they apply across the scope of a company's operations? Additional core principles then, numbers you see here address the implementation of these policies and the action the companies are meant to take. So they address everything from different company systems and how commitments should be implemented across them, traceability, supply chain management, for companies who are at the production level, they also include um, guidance around land use planning, land management, remedy and remediation. And then of course, there is a principle as well around collaboration to achieve commitment. So what are the types of influences and actions that we want to encourage companies to take um, with other stakeholders at the production level, whether within jurisdictions, with government counterparts, with the civil society, to help um, to collaboratively achieve those commitments and their landscapes where they're operating and sourcing. And then finally, core principles 11 and 12 address um, demonstration of progress. So these provide guidance that companies can use as they are monitoring, documenting, and reporting on their progress to ensure that this is done in a credible way. Next slide, please. Thank you. And then these core principles are accompanied by a set of operational guidance. So there's a lot of detail within the core principles um, that um, the core principles themselves um, provide a, a guidance level normative sort of overview of expectations around setting, implementing, and demonstrating progress and commitments. The operational gui guidance complements this and goes into additional detail. Here we have the different sections of operational guidance mapped out against the supply chain journey. So for example, we have guidance around cutoff dates that's important for a company to consider when they're setting commitments. This is also the type of material, as Akiva will discuss a bit later, be very useful to those working in jurisdictions or governments as well as they're looking at certain sector cutoff dates, for example. We have guidance on free prior and informed consent. That's important to be considered when commitments are being set, but also when action is taken. And this ties closely with our guidance around the rights of indigenous peoples and local communities. We saw smallholders, of course, in the development of this framework as a key component of um, successful ethical supply chain development and implementation. And so there's a specific operational guidance around smallholders that addresses how they can best be supported as they um, as a part of ethical supply chains and how companies could aim to achieve this. There's guidance around supply chain management. And then we have specific guidance complementing core principles 11 and 12 around monitoring and verification and reporting and disclosure. And all of these are aiming to provide much more detail for companies to use as they're developing their different sourcing protocols, implementation systems, and others, and also to provide clarity for the broader community of those, whether they're in policy making or working um, around accountability through civil society or in support of companies' implementation, for example, to make sure that we are all in this, have the same understanding of what good looks like and what the expectations are around this so that there can be greater focus on implementation um, and less confusion around those issues. Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, for setting commitments, we intend for companies, first and foremost, to look at core principles one through three. We also are developing additional tools to complement this. So as companies are looking at the different principles and elements of the framework, um, we understand that their teams um, may need other tools and other formats of our materials to be able to effectively integrate this into company policies and protocols. So we've developed as well a self-assessment checklist for company staff or their service providers to use to evaluate whether their existing commitments are or are not aligned with the recognized good practice that is outlined in the framework. We also 
um, recommend that they use are the framework's definitions and associated guidance with that to ensure that key concepts um, and terminology um, is integrated into policies and used consistently. We have the guidance on cutoff dates that I mentioned as well. And so this provides guidance um, for companies to be able to align their policies with accepted and acceptable timeframes for commitments for um, target dates. And also to use the framework's guidance around the rights of indigenous people in local communities to ensure that the elements of a company commitment is set up to effectively respect these rights and to um, make sure that the um, these issues are uh, correctly integrated as well into um, company supply chain management systems. Next slide, please. And taking action. Um, of course, we have um, core principles four through six to address supply chain management. So this is looking at everything from risk assessment, um, improving supply chain traceability, engaging and supporting suppliers, how non-compliance is managed when non-compliance is an issue. And overall, I'd like to point out here too that the position of the accountability framework initiative um, is that we encourage um, engagement with suppliers um, and for companies to work towards on time-bound action plans with non-compliance suppliers wherever possible, while our guidance, however, does um, specify um, uh, cutoff of certain suppliers in certain very egregious cases of non-compliance as well. Our core principles seven and eight also um, address uh, free prior and informed consent and we will be adding some guidance in to complement those core principles around long-term protection and that should be issued towards the end of this year. Um, this, these principles as I mentioned are especially um, useful for those working at the production level as they cover responsible land acquisition and development protection of ecological and cultural values following HGV, et cetera. Core principle nine then addresses remediation and restoration. So this includes uh, guidance for companies on their responsibility for addressing past harms, whether it's through assets that they have acquired or whether it is through past um, behavior of the company itself. And then principle 10 goes into broader collaboration. So this is guidance that companies can use as they're assessing policies and looking at how they can better work either with peer companies and the landscapes where they're operating or with other sector initiatives or landscape or sectoral jurisdictional initiatives as well. Next slide, please. And finally, of course, um, demonstrating progress, which has been a key issue and was a key impetus for the accountability framework to be developed itself. Um, the guidance we have to uh, accompany core principles 11 and 12 um, are, are the different metrics, um, guidance around monitoring and verification, really aiming to help companies more credibly demonstrate the progress that they're making. Um, and all of the guidance within these core principles and in the accompanying um, operational guidance as well, um, as I mentioned, is also being integrated into different methodologies as we're working closely with the reporting assessment community. So we're really working to try to streamline as much as possible the guidance from the accountability framework into existing monitoring and verification tools that companies and others are already using, such as Global Forest Watch, and also into the reporting systems such as CDP Forest or assessment systems like Forest 500 that are looking critically at company performance um, and assessing it so that we can have a common basis for understanding um, more broadly across the community. And again, that should allow for greater accountability and transparency in the sector. Next slide, please. So we have a clear value proposition for companies. Um, and I think a lot of the way I've been talking already about the framework um, is probably making that clear. Um, our value proposition is essentially that we have now a consensus-based set of civil society expectations around ethical supply chain commitments. So there's no longer any confusion about what a strong commitment should look like, nor should there be confusion around what good implementation looks like, what reporting should look like, and what credible verification, et cetera, looks like. We're also working to provide the tools and guidance or to align with existing tools and guidance to help companies manage their environmental and social risk and exposure through this initiative. It essentially offers a shared language that can be used across different commodities and geographies and supply chains for all types of user groups, whether it's private sector, civil society, government, and others, and we'll talk a little more about this in a moment, to harmonize different definitions uh, and norms. 
So our hope is that as we have reached consensus around this and as the different definitions and norms and metrics of the framework are taken up and starting to be used by different sector initiatives, policymakers, companies, et cetera, that we see this alignment across the way we are thinking and ad about and addressing these issues and that that can accelerate progress, lead to greater clarity um, and lead to, of course, better, more impact on the ground around implementation of these commitments and their goals. It's looking to strengthen and streamline transactions along supply chains as well by standardizing expectations and, of course, to streamline and reduce reporting burdens since there is a consistent set of expectations now available through the framework. And this, of course, and following the guidance should strengthen credibility of claims. So there should be also less confusion around this, um, less ambiguity and um, a greater ability to be able to see where strong and credible claims are being made and where they're not being made and where additional work is needed. Next slide, please. We also, though, see the accountability framework as a key tool for other actors as well. And while a lot of the work around the initiative has, of course, been geared towards the, um, the set of commitments that were made following the New York Declaration on Forests in 2014 with 2020 deadlines um, by many, many companies, we also have been very cognizant and working closely with members of civil society and different government-led initiatives or public-private sector initiatives to see how this framework can be used by other actors as we see this as a key way to make sure that this um, common set of norms and guidance is uh, effectively implemented um, and can help to strengthen accountability across the board. So linking local activities to global norms through civil society um, by using the framework is one of the ways that we can, we can do this. So having a common set of expectations should help civil society, whether it's at a local production level or whether it's at a global international level, to be sending clear and consistent signals around expectations to commodity buyers and other stakeholders. The framework can also be used by civil society groups to develop advocacy positions that are based on accepted expectations and goals and to approve the effectiveness and compatibility of various tools and standards and monitoring systems that civil society groups are involved with um, the development of. By governments also, we can improve the effectiveness and compatibility, we think, of government tools and monitoring systems and other sources of supply chain data, such as concession boundaries or tax information or other data sets that governments collect um, and publicly release on an annual basis by aligning these with the norms, definitions, and terms that are used in the accountability framework so that there's a clear set of expectations coming not only from civil society, but hopefully also from governments and that this is aligned with the market signals that companies are receiving. In aligning these national policies, we could also look at the different landscape and jurisdictional approaches that are ongoing and work specifically with these or other sector initiatives to help align them as well with global norms. And we're starting to see some of this uptake already um, in some, uh, with some of the partners that we've been working with um, in Southeast Asia. It can also be used to promote efforts to support communities and smallholders to improve their production practices, habitat restoration efforts, to promote partnerships with companies and other stakeholders, um, as well as looking at restoration of larger landscapes and ecosystems. So we would hope that the guidance that's available in the framework that addresses smallholders, that addresses communities, production restoration, et cetera, can also be useful for initiatives addressing these issues or by government policies addressing them, support to smallholders, for example, so that this greater alignment can mean that um, their, their production practices are more in line with what buyers are looking for and thus that these smallholders can be more effectively integrated into um, supply chains. Next slide, please. Great, and now I'm gonna pass over to Akiva um, to talk a little bit about how we think um, commitments can be achieved through collaboration and to mention a few of the key aspects of the accountability frameworks guidance um, in core principle 10 and our accompanying operational guidance around this. Akiva? Yeah, thanks Adrian. So, so Adrian just gave a quick overview of the full suite of topics on which AFI provides guidance. And many of these topics deal with the elements of a company's efforts to eliminate deforestation, conversion, and human rights violations from within its own supply chain including sections dealing with supplier management, traceability, reporting and disclosure, and so on. But the accountability framework also recognizes that deforestation, conversion, and human rights violations often have deeper root causes and can't be controlled solely by the actions that companies might take. These causes are very familiar to those who work in the land governance space and include things like 
weak governance capacity, corruption, unclear land tenure, illegal encroachment, and many others. So the framework includes a section of guidance that, first of all, acknowledges the responsibility of companies to take action together with other stakeholders to help address these deep challenges on top of the things that they do to improve their own supply chains. And then this section also discusses some of the types of actions that companies can take in this regard. So let's go to the next slide. The 10th core principle that Adrian briefly reviewed and its accompanying section of guidance frame some high-level expectations to begin with. First is that companies will participate in multi-stakeholder initiatives aimed at addressing critical social and environmental challenges at scale. The nature and degree of participation may differ depending on parameters like where the company sits in the supply chain or its market share within the supply chain, but the common expectation that companies will engage is clearly articulated. And this is critical because these types of initiatives are the only way to ensure that even top-notch work that's done by individual companies or other actors doesn't simply displace impacts to neighboring farms. This is leakage that we all worry about. Companies are also expected not to simply withdraw from geographies with social and environmental risk as a way to mitigate their exposure to those risks. Rather, like Adrian mentioned before, the default approach that AFI takes is for companies to remain engaged in those geographies and use their influence to address these risks. It's also not enough for a company to do its own homework in applying the accountability framework's guidance. This needs to be complemented by efforts to encourage other actors in the company's sphere of influence, like suppliers, customers, peers, industry groups, and governments, to act in ways that are compatible with the guidance. Part of this includes clear communication by companies to suppliers of their AFI-aligned sourcing requirements and a system of incentives to move suppliers towards compliance with those sourcing requirements. And finally, AFI's guidance captures the expectation that companies will ensure that their advocacy with governments is consistent with their own supply chain commitments in alignment with AFI framework guide, with accountability framework guidance. Next slide, please. So I mentioned that the framework goes into some specific actions that companies can take to support multi-stakeholder efforts in the most effective ways available. The guidance differs depending on a company's supply chain position. For example, commodity producers can share their spatial data with, and management plans with the government and other stakeholders to facilitate more effective land use planning. They can also play an important role in disseminating best management practices and technologies to communities and smallholders to boost their ability to contribute to deforestation and conversion-free economies. For companies further down the supply chain, the accountability framework suggests actions like financially supporting upstream companies to take actions to meet framework guidance, for example, restoration to redress recent deforestation or establishing effective FPIC procedures or grievance mechanisms. Downstream companies can also use their commodity purchases to incentivize suppliers or potential suppliers to act in accordance with company policies and elements of the accountability framework. Another opportunity is to collaborate with other downstream companies sourcing from the same region to address common challenges by sharing information or pooling resources. And then companies may choose to condition their sourcing decisions on positive performance, not only by their direct suppliers, but of the broader jurisdiction in which the suppliers operate. This can be a tool for rewarding jurisdictions that are effectively addressing deforestation, conversion, and human rights violations, and for incentivizing other jurisdictions to do so as well. Next slide, please. So all of these actions and others besides are intended to help address deforestation, conversion, and human rights risks at large scales, and effectively to make whole landscapes or jurisdictions low risk for these impacts. Often, governments and other stakeholders will work collaboratively to develop jurisdictional systems that can in turn be used by companies to help fulfill their supply chain commitments. These jurisdictional systems include monitoring mechanisms, such as remote sensing tools that monitor land cover change across jurisdictions, and these would include national forest monitoring systems. The systems also include verification or enforcement systems, such as government-led systems that require certain parameters or elements of compliance to be verified across an entire jurisdiction. Then there are land governance systems, like some jurisdictional Red Plus programs, or other multi-stakeholder initiatives that integrate land use planning, market-based incentives, and other mechanisms to address deforestation, conversion, and land governance holistically across an entire jurisdiction. 
And then there are landscape or jurisdictional assessment frameworks that assess performance metrics across entire landscapes or jurisdictions. Systems like these are not often designed or implemented rigorously, but when they are, and the accountability framework discusses the parameters for robustness, companies can make use of these systems to meet elements of accountability framework guidance that the systems effectively address. And then the last point to make here is that where jurisdictional systems are implemented successfully to the point that the covered landscape or jurisdiction might be deemed low risk for deforestation, conversion, and human rights violations, companies may be able to operate more freely there. More specifically, under those circumstances, land managers within the jurisdiction and companies that buy commodities from these land managers would not need to monitor or verify impacts down to the level of the individual production unit because the impacts would have been monitored or verified at the level of the jurisdiction. And second, companies that source commodities from the jurisdiction would not need to achieve traceability to individual farms beyond the level of the jurisdiction because, again, the jurisdiction was deemed to be low risk at the jurisdictional scale. So the carrot here is potentially very large for companies as there could be significant cost savings implications here. I do want to be clear that there are not currently any jurisdictions that I would consider to be low risk, at least not in tropical producing regions, but this is ultimately one of the major incentives for jurisdictions to address deforestation, conversion, and human rights at scale. On top of the local benefits that would accrue to people and nature from taking care of these impacts, and on top of the potential for performance-based payments, jurisdictions that manage these impacts effectively could see increased market, market access as companies increasingly are looking to work with and buy from these places. Then if you'll go to the next slide, I'll hand it back to Adrian for a brief wrap up. Thanks. Great, thank you, Akiva. Yes, we just wanted to point out to you as well, um, all of this information and in the entire framework, in fact, is available on our website, which is accountabilityframework.org. Um, you'll see that at the bottom here. You can also subscribe there to our newsletters. You can follow us on Twitter, and there are many resources on our website itself that will walk you through the supply chain journey and point to the different ways that the accountability framework can be used depending on um, the sector or organization that you're representing and working with. Next slide, please. And I wanted to also point out that we're receiving funding from the following organizations. Um, they've helped to make the development of this framework possible and continue to support us. So I wanted to um, recognize the UK government, Swiss, Norway, the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation, as well um, as Germans for their support here. Next slide, please. And back over to you, Emily. Great, thank you both so much. That was really interesting. We've got a couple of questions now um, through the question function, but participants, this is your moment. If you have something you've been wondering about, um, as Adrian and Akiva have been speaking, this is the time to send in your question. Uh, the first one I have is um, sort of a, a more explanatory question about uh, the relationship of AFI to ICEAL, I-S-E-A-L. Can um, Adrian, maybe you can speak to that specific relationship a little bit more? Sure, I'd be happy to, and thanks for that question. Um, we are working closely with ICEAL and with many of their members, um, of course, uh, throughout the development of the framework, and we continue to now after we have officially launched it as of um, June of this year. Um, we see, of course, standards and certification standards as being a key tool for companies to use as they're looking to um, credibly demonstrate compliance with the commitments that they've made. Um, we also, of course, then recognize that a key part um, of alignment with these certification systems will be to work closely with them and to look at where the different um, metrics and norms that we have in the framework are already represented in these standards and systems, and then to also work with them perhaps to identify areas where um, elements of these standard, um, standard systems could, could be improved or um, additionally enhanced to be in alignment with the accountability framework. The framework, though, I would like to point out was really aiming to also address the, the large volume of large non-certified volume, really, globally. Um, it's recognized that um, while certification systems can be very effective, they, they do have, of course, limitations in that there are many commodities that um, are not covered by certification standards um, and many geographies as which for certain 
where sort of certain certification systems perhaps may be being used but have not yet been fully contextualized, um, for example, with palm oil in Central um, and West Africa. And we know that many of these processes are still underway, and so we are aiming and looking to work as closely as we can with different stakeholders um, in these areas to, to ensure alignment as much as possible, and we do that in close communication with ICEAL. Yeah, I'll just add that that was a great uh, synopsis of the relationship with certifications, and I'll add that formally, AFI is agnostic with respect to certifications, meaning that AFI is not advocating for use of certifications. It's also not saying you should not use certifications. Instead, what it does is to say that certifications can be a really useful tool for meeting elements of AFI's guidance. Um, now, not all certifications are created equal, and some certifications do a better job of addressing the issues of deforestation, conversion, and human rights than others. And uh, it is an ambition of AFI in the coming months to start doing some benchmarking of some of the certification standards against the AFI's guidance to be able to more clearly articulate which certifications are able to help with which elements of AFI's guidance. Um, that said, um, certifications generally also deal with many more issues uh, on sustainability than AFI's scope does. So like Adrian mentioned, AFI really is limited to addressing deforestation, conversion, and the issues of human rights and labor rights. Um, many certifications will go into things like soil management, water management, um, biodiversity, all those sorts of really important issues. Um, so this is, we are not suggesting that companies should be using AFI to the exclusion of certifications to address those other uh, important environmental and social challenges. Um, all AFI is trying to do is to harmonize what is considered best practice specifically on the issues of deforestation, conversion, and human rights. So when companies and other stakeholders are seeking to address a broader suite of sustainability and social issues, um, certifications have more to say about those other topics as well. Great, thank you. We've got a couple of questions here about jurisdictional risks. Um, so can you talk a little bit more about how jurisdictional risk is measured, who decides the criteria, um, and what the, you know, what the definitions might be within the framework of what constitutes a low risk versus a high risk jurisdiction? Yeah, it's a really good question. And um, it's a, sort of a live topic and one that um, the steering group is continuing to think about. Um, the, the, the guidance that is currently available online uh, is, does not fully address the question of how do you identify a risky jurisdiction. Um, I mean, very basically, a risky jurisdiction is one in which there is still active deforestation, conversion, and human rights violations going on, but there is nothing quantitative currently in the accountability framework guidance that would um, indicate, you know, what is the threshold for high risk or low risk. Um, that is th that is a question that is currently being developed, or the answers to that question are being developed by other initiatives um, outside of the AFI formally. Uh, and there are a number of them. Um, there's one called the Commodities Jurisdictions Approach. There's one called the, the Land Scale Tool. Um, there's the Verified Sourcing uh, Area Approach. Um, there are a couple of these that are being developed, and they're basically trials to determine you know, what can we say about jurisdictions in terms of their risk of various impacts and what are the implications of those. Um, all AFI says on the topic at this point is, when you have established that a jurisdiction is at low risk of these impacts, then here are the implications that I went through. Um, but AFI itself is not currently um, trying to articulate uh, how you determine what jurisdiction is high risk or low risk. That's that's an area for additional guidance to come in the coming months and years. Thanks, Adrian. I didn't know if you wanted to add anything to what Akiva said. No, I think that captured it really well. Fantastic. Um, we have some questions here also about companies. So do you have any assessment or any information you can share about any companies that have signed on or uh, are actively participating in you know, applying the framework guidance to their supply chain commitments? Anything that you can share with us at this time? 
Sure, yeah, I'd be happy to answer that. Um, throughout the development of the framework, um, throughout that development process, as I mentioned, we were working closely with a lot of different companies, and so we saw many start to use the guidance of the framework even before um, we had launched it, and that, that trend seems to be continuing, um, which is a great sign. So um, some companies have um, directly referenced the accountability framework in their public policies. So for example, Cargill's um, latest policy around deforestation, um, the supplier code um, around for Mars as well mentions um, our definition on deforestation. So there's different elements of the framework that um, several companies have started to, to mention and reference and use in their policies. Um, we don't have a comprehensive list to share with everyone um, per se at the moment, but we are continuing to track this. And at the moment, we're starting to work um, closely with a handful of companies that really want to apply the guidance sort of from um, across that supply chain journey. So from setting their commitments to implementation to reporting on progress. And so we hopefully will see a lot more in the coming months around how companies will be applying and using this guidance, um, how that can be reinforced, of course, as well by the work we're doing with civil society and with governments um, in various regions and jurisdictions as well. But we are certainly seeing um, quite a, quite a few companies start to use the framework uh, and getting feedback from that as well, which is exciting. Yeah, and I can add from WF side that we, we are actively working with a number of companies um, who are setting or refreshing or implementing their commitments on deforestation, and we are you know very directly using the accountability frameworks guidance uh, in our advising with those companies. And I know from conversations with other organizations that work with companies in similar capacities that they are also using AFI in this way. Um, we AFI is not necessarily seeking, you know, public um, uh, endorsement from companies. Uh, it's certainly nice when companies want to sort of publicly disclose that they are, you know, using AFI guidance in in setting and implementing their commitments. Uh, but I expect that there will be companies that, you know, it will, the average person looking at their website won't know that AFI is in the background, um, helping to make sure the the guidance, helping to make sure that the policies and their implementation are being done in a credible way. Um, maybe that's something that the AFI steering group might talk about going forward if there's value in, you know, putting more, um, getting more information about, you know, which companies are doing what out there. Um, but that's sort of the state of things right now. Thank you. Can you um, talk a little bit more? You've both mentioned Red Plus and, you know, government efforts, but can you talk a little bit more about the synergies between, say, red readiness rules and safeguards and AFI, and for countries that are working on readiness, do you have a recommended kind of place in that process where AFI would be really useful or strategic to include to, to be included? Yeah, it's a good question, and it goes a little bit above my head because I am not an expert in the red readiness process, so I, I certainly couldn't speak to like where in the process it makes most sense to bring in AFI, but at a higher level, um, you know, the objectives of of a Red Plus program and uh, are, is basically they are aligned with AFI's objectives around deforestation, conversion, human rights. Um, the idea is that um, we want to make sure that the expectations of civil society reflected in the accountability framework guidance and the expectations or the outputs of Red Plus programs uh, are moving in the same direction and aligned um, so that we can ensure that whatever progress is being made in a Red Plus program uh, is basically ambitious enough um, to uh, meet the approval of civil society and vice versa. We wanna make sure that Red Plus um, guidance and standards are reflected in the way that we treat deforestation and human rights issues in AFI. Um, so, I mean, that, that is, I can't give like more of a, a in the weeds answer than that at this point. We need to speak to colleagues who are kind of a bit more engage in the Red Plus mechanism than I am. Um, but that's, I guess, a starting point. Yeah, and I could just add in that, you know, in many of the workshops we've done in regions, at least, we've had always had um, colleagues from the different um, ministry, technical colleagues from ministries within government and those working directly with the red units and such um, as part of those. So we wanted to make sure that there, there were key stakeholders want to make sure that had awareness of what 
what materials are included in the framework, what we're addressing, and to get their perspectives as well. So it certainly is to build on what Akiva said, um, a process, I think, and, and something we're looking to continue to identify and enhance um, and looking at ways that the initiative itself can provide um, materials to help help those working on RED to be able to effectively use the, the contents and guidance in the framework. Yeah, and the other thing I should add is just that a lot of the RED programs at jurisdictional scales are increasingly looking to bring the private sector in as co-designers of the program and co-implementers. Um, for example, Ghana's RED Plus program focused on cocoa, very sort of in an upfront way, includes cocoa companies uh, in, the, in the initiative. And so the idea is that if companies are going to be engaging in these Red Plus programs, which is fantastic, um, they also need some guidance on how to credibly engage, uh, you know, when they are working on these deforestation initiatives at scale, um, how are they to know um, whether what they're doing is, um, like I said, ambitious enough. Um, and so I think we're seeing a bit of um, a coming together of the corporate space and the governance space. Um, that started out in more isolation. I would say that, you know, what, 10 years ago, let's say, when these deforestation-free commitments started being made by companies, uh, they were made in a, in a silo from the efforts that governments had been taking to address deforestation for much longer. Um, and now we're starting to see these programs developing that are seeking to bring together company efforts to address deforestation in their supply chain, with government efforts to address deforestation within their territories. And AFI is helpful to make sure that the expectations and the goals that we're all pushing toward are, are rigorous and credible. Um, you know, we all know of the, you know, there are uh, initiatives out there seeking to address deforestation that don't have especially high ambition. Um, some of them are seeking to limit deforestation by a certain percent, but not trying to address it much beyond that. And so AFI is helpful for setting what is the expectation for really credible progress on, on these issues. Um, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you. Sort of following on that, um, you know, you've described the framework really as a framework. It's not a new um, certification system. There's no sort of additional um, commitments that are required under the AFI necessarily. It's to help them, help companies better deliver on the commitments that they've already made. Um, but can you talk a little bit about, you know, what might happen if a company using the AFI um, isn't, in fact, delivering on those commitments or isn't really using AFI's guidance in the proper way? Is there any sort of monitoring or monitoring, yeah, of the framework in its implementation to see sort of whether companies are using it in, in good faith? That's a great question. Um, so. As we mentioned earlier, the framework itself is not looking to, to do direct assessment of companies. Um, but within that, we do have some specific guidance that um, anyone can see on our website as well as to how we recommend that companies make any claims around the way they are using the framework to, um, to guide the development of their commitments and their implementation and such. Um, we do want to be careful, of course, and we will be trying to track the way that the AFI itself or the framework and its guidance is being um, communicated about, but not in the same way that an assessment initiative necessarily would. So we won't be looking to do any kind of um, assessing of company performance or any scorecarding per se, but rather the work that we've been doing with those in that community, um, CDP Forest, we're working also with supply change, um, they're really going to be playing that role and continuing to, and the alignment of the accountability frameworks, definitions, and norms into their methodologies should enable that to happen. So, for example, um, supply change is going to start tracking mentions of the accountability framework as they look at um, company policies and annual reports on a yearly basis um, and communicate about that through their um, their dashboards on their website. So there will be ways that the reporting and assessment community will be tracking and sharing that information. And we're really looking um, to work with them to make sure that there's sort of correct alignment and use of AFI's definitions and norms within their methodologies. Um, and then of course, um, encouraging its use by companies and, and we'll be we'll be looking at the way that companies communicate about the framework but but not in so much of an assessment way. We'll we'll leave that to the reporting and assessment community and the work that that many um, really dynamic initiatives are already doing in that space. 
Yeah, this really goes back to the slide that Adrian showed at the beginning of the presentation where, you know, she showed two sort of anonymized different palm oil scorecards that different NGOs use to rate the, the progress of companies on their palm oil commitments. And the problem was that there were different ways of assessing companies and there was, you know, confusion being sown as a result. And so what AFI is doing is helping to create the the template for uh, what is uh, an actual credible commitment and credible implementation of that commitment so that we have more consistency in the ways that companies are being assessed. Uh, so while, like Adrian said, AFI is not going to do that assessment, um, it's really active behind the scenes to make sure that those assessment mechanisms are using, are drawing from AFI guidance to make sure that companies are using the guidance appropriately. Great, and sort of along similar lines, um, will there be a review system that will share things like lessons learned and challenges in different regions throughout, you know, or within the AFI framework, different processes? You know, I, I love a good knowledge sharing and learning question. Yeah, excellent question as well. We are looking to develop, um, you know, and highlight some cases where the framework's guidance is being used in a way that can be helpful I think, for others who are trying to also apply the guidance um, in their supply chains. It's something that we're beginning to work on now. And I think as the guidance or as the framework is increasingly being used going forward, um, now that we've, we've just launched in June, we'll be able to start capturing those experiences. And so that's something to keep an eye out for on our website as we go forward. We will certainly try to share those. We probably will have um, some of these cases available maybe at some point in next year, I think giving a few months, um, at least through the rest of this year, to look at how the guidance is being applied and to capture some of those examples. And then we would look to try to, um, to put those up on our website. So yes, please stay tuned for that. Fantastic. And do you have guidance within your guidance about how companies can start engaging or adopting a AFI? Do you have sort of like first steps? These are the things you need to do before you can really dive in? Yeah, so um, I mentioned it just briefly one slide, um, but when when we um, are encouraging companies to to start really with uh, the beginning of the supply chain journey, really, even if they already have had commitments for quite a while, because an important first step, um, as Akiva mentioned earlier as well, is to look at where their current commitments are and how well they align with the accountability framework's guidance. So we have created a checklist that companies can use to start to bench benchmark the contents of their commitments and policies to the framework. And then based on that, they would be able to identify the various other core principles and pieces of guidance that would help them then to to, um, refine or um, adopt their or adapt rather different implementation systems that they may currently be using or to add in others um, to further align with, with implementation then of those policies. So we do have this checklist tool to look um, at benchmarking existing commitments and then of course the core principles themselves can be used by a company who's just starting um, and creating their commitments and policies for the first time. It really walks them through um, how to use the different pieces of the guidance and there are many resources on our platform in fact on the website that help to walk companies through that ethical supply chain journey that are intended um, for exactly that purpose. Yeah so just picking up from where Adrian left off um, the website is designed to have a couple of different pathways for different users to access information. Uh, one of those pathways is designed for employees of companies that are looking to identify like how do I interact with the material well if I am at the point of needing to develop a new policy then there's a certain pathway for them to pursue on the website if they're looking to improve their supplier management system there's a certain pathway to pursue um, we are in the process of collecting feedback on the website to make sure that we are able to kind of address all the various pathways of different users in a, in a user-friendly way um, and the other thing I think I can share is that um, while we currently do have the checklist tool that Adrian mentioned, which is keyed to um, the first three core principles that address how to set up an effective or a credible uh, supply chain commitment, we are also in the process of developing a full checklist tool that looks at the entire uh, framework, all of the core principles and guidance um, that a company could use to benchmark not only its commitments, but also the ways in which it is implementing its commitment. And I don't have in details on exactly when that'll be ready, but that's something that we're working on right now. Fantastic, thank you so much. Um, sort of along those lines, we have time for this last one uh, logistical question, which is whether it's possible to download the framework guidance in a single document from the website, or is it all uh, available sort of in bits as you go through the website? 
So it is available for download on the website. Um, we are um, working with our comms team to create um, a single PDF as well. So someone could download all 250 plus plate pages of the framework at once if they so desire. Um, there are though within the different sections, each section does have a download button though. So each section of the framework can be downloaded currently. Um, and as Akiva mentioned, you can walk through the different pieces of guidance directly also through these various user pathways that are included on the platform. So there's sort of different ways to access the information. Great, thank you so much. Um, looks like we've come really to the end of our time today. So I'm gonna ask Jenny to go to the next slide. Um, thank you both Adrian and Akiva for sharing your expertise with our community. And I wanna thank the participants who joined us today for sending in your thoughtful and really engaging questions. Um, I can tell just by the number of questions we had that you guys, this is a topic that you're really engaged in. Um, which speaks to the increasing role we see of the private sector in this larger forest and climate work. Um, so thank you all for coming and joining us today. And you all receive your follow-up email in about an hour with a link to the website um, that Adrian mentioned and some additional resources as well. Next slide, please. And if you want to revisit this webinar or share it with colleagues, the recording will be up on our YouTube channel probably by the end of today, if not tomorrow. And you can also find recordings of previous sessions there for additional enrichment. So we did have someone ask if there were other webinars that describe RED or RED+. Plus. Our, web, our YouTube channel is a great place to go for that kind of resource. Next slide, please. So thank you all again for joining us, and I hope you have a great day.